Crowdfunding has done some interesting things to the video game industry. It's provided hope for sequels to forgotten franchises, disappointing spiritual successors, and even a bit of controversy when it comes to the ethics of changing plans in the middle of development, like certain games which were funded by players expecting to get their game on one advertised platform, only to have the creators decide to cut an exclusivity deal with a less consumer-friendly competitor. Remember Kickstarter backers when I promised to release Phoenix Point on Steam? That's right, Major. You did. I lied. <laughs> this is one of the reasons it's important to look at crowdfunding as a gamble rather than any kind of guarantee. With all that can go wrong with a crowdfunded game, there have been a few success stories, like Project Warlock, which was the subject of my previous video. The teenage lead designer of that game launched a Kickstarter looking for 90 euros to buy some development tools, which he eventually used to create that awesome shooter. Later this month, a game is coming out which I hope will be a similar success story. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is the spiritual successor to the Castlevania games, specifically the ones which were designed by Koji Igarashi, notably Symphony of the Night, the amazing Game Boy Advance games, and the equally amazing but very hard to capture footage of DS games. I made it three videos in without stealing footage from other creators, but short of filming a screen with a physical camera, I can't for the life of me determine how one might capture DS footage. It's been in development for quite some time, so hopefully it'll turn out well, but even if it is as underwhelming as Mighty No. 9, the Bloodstained Kickstarter campaign has already produced one spectacular game. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon was a stretch goal for the campaign. Advertised as a prequel minigame, we'd all be forgiven for thinking it would be a quick, cheap rush job with a handful of levels and very basic gameplay. What we got instead was a full-on love letter to Castlevania III Dracula's Curse, with four playable characters, eight levels, and multiple ways to play through the campaign. In addition to a surprising amount of quantity, Curse of the Moon's content is also very high quality. It fundamentally plays in the same way the classic Castlevania games did. It's laid out in set levels, and while there are branching pathways, they're essentially linear with no open exploration the way Ritual of the Night will have. This is just a straight up action platformer based on learning enemy patterns, timing animations, utilizing a variety of sub weapons, and appreciating some classic, but still beautiful graphics. There are a few things that give the game away as a modern title, but all of them are quite welcome. The aforementioned graphics have more depth to them than an actual 8-bit title would have had in the NES era. The controls are responsive and tight, swapping between the game's playable characters can be performed on the fly with the shoulder buttons, and the levels are certainly larger than the old Castlevania levels, with a checkpoint system that makes them more manageable and less frustrating. Not that I'm against games being difficult, as I'm a big fan of the Souls games, Bloodborne, and of course, Sekiro. The game's 8 levels can be played through in around 1 hour if you really know what you're doing, but thinking this is as simple as being an hour long game is a mistake. Somewhat like the 2017 masterpiece of video game storytelling, Nier Automata, you can play through the game a second time with not only gameplay variations, but a story that picks up where the end of the first playthrough leaves off. There's a normal campaign, followed by the nightmare campaign. I initially thought this sort of creates a Bloodstained trilogy, with the normal Curse of the Moon being the first part, Nightmare Curse of the Moon being the second, and Ritual of the Night being the third, but apparently Ritual of the Night's scenario has been rewritten, so Curse of the Moon is now less a prequel and more of a non-canon side story, which is a bit of a shame as it'd be cool if Bloodstained were developing lore which would be consistent over multiple games. I guess we'll find out for sure when Ritual of the Night comes out on June 18th though. In addition to two main story playthroughs, there are two other varying campaigns. One in which you avoid all the recruitable characters, going through the normal campaign as a base power level version of the Swordsman Zangetsu, with no assistance at all. That one was honestly too hard for me to make any real progress in, but it's there if you're an absolute mad lad. The other one also has you play only as Zangetsu, but rather than politely declining assistance from the other team members, you kill them, with each of their souls bestowing an ability upon you. This run is much more manageable than the hardest run, but full disclosure, I still haven't finished it. At launch I got stuck at the haunted ship, although on picking the game back up in order to make this video, I, I cleared the ship, so so there we are. W one day I'll finish that campaign.
both of the Zangetsu only campaigns are what if scenarios, so they aren't really required in order to get the full story that Curse of the Moon's trying to present, like the five ending routes of Nier Automata were, but it's really cool the developer Inti Creates managed to bake as much variety as they did into these eight levels. The two primary story runs involve a multiple character mechanic that is similar to the character switching from Castlevania 3, but is handled in a much more modern way. Rather than hitting select to slowly switch between two playable characters, you use the shoulder buttons to instantly swap between four different characters. This adds a layer of strategy in which if you're anticipating a boss's attack which you aren't confident you'll be able to dodge, you can quickly switch to a character who has more remaining health to tank the damage. You are punished by letting a character die by being moved back to a checkpoint, so you do have to make an effort to avoid that, but you only lose a life when all four characters have been killed. In addition to creative swapping in order to maximize your health pool, each character has a distinct advantage in both certain combat scenarios and environmental puzzles. Swordsman Zangetsu's attacks are straight, fast, and powerful, but are very short range, so you won't want to use him at a distance or at an odd angle, but if you manage to get a window where you can attack and you're close to a boss, he can do a lot of damage in a very short period of time. Sharbinder and Whip Wielder Miriam, who happens to be the hero of Ritual of the Night as well, does about the same damage per strike as Zangetsu, but at a much longer range. What she lacks is attack speed. She also has less health, but can jump higher and slide to dodge enemy attacks in ways the swordsman cannot, and reach alternate paths to uncover secrets. Alchemist Alfred is slow, has terrible range, and definitely doesn't have Miriam's gymnastic prowess, but he can wield spells which can defeat path-blocking enemies, as well as just... just wreck certain bosses. Finally, we have another Shardbinder, Gable, who is a rather direct homage to Alucard from Castlevania 3 and Symphony of the Night. Gable has a 3 projectile attack, which is short range, but is rather fast and attacks in 3 directions. This is quite useful, as it's the only way to attack upwards without using subweapon power. Where you will use subweapon power as Gable is when he turns into a bat and gives you the ability to travel through small passages as well as traverse great chasms. Just be careful not to begin a flight without the correct amount of fuel in the tank or... I'm gonna make it! I'm gonna make it! This is the greatest thrill of my life! I'm king of the world! Woohoo! Woohoo! I... Ah! None of these design features would mean anything if the game wasn't fun to play, and this may be a controversial opinion, but the core feel of the controls in Curse of the Moon is actually better than the classic Castlevania games. It strikes a nice middle ground between the slow, deliberate feel of classic Castlevania and the fast, fluid feel of the Igarashi games like Symphony of the Night. You still need to be mindful of both enemy patterns and the length of your attack animation, so if you've got skill at, say, Castlevania 3 or played the recent PS4 release of Rondo of Blood in the Requiem Collection, those skills will transfer quite well. But if you've only played the Igarashi games, it still won't be quite as disorienting as, say, jumping back to the original Castlevania. In a way, Curse of the Moon can act as not only an entry point for the Bloodstained universe as intended, but also as a way to dip your toe in the classic Castlevania pool. And there's no better time for that really, as Konami just released the Castlevania Anniversary Collection on PC and all modern consoles, which incidentally is where you'll find Curse of the Moon. This isn't a PC Master Race video like my Project Warlock video was. This game is on everything. Even Vita. Good night, sweet prince. You were too good for this world. Ritual of the Night isn't out yet, so for all I know it's going to be a Mighty No. 9s disappointment, but even if it is, the Bloodstained Kickstarter campaign, which for the record I did not back, has already produced one awesome game. While it won't blow you away if you hate all action side-scrollers or you're opposed to the 8-bit pixel art aesthetic, if you are a man of culture, have any interest in the Castlevania series, or are anticipating Ritual of the Night, Curse of the Moon is quite possibly the best $10 you could spend on a video game. Mark the Cyborg certainly recommends Bloodstained Curse of the Moon.